All righty, everyone. Welcome to church. Who's excited to be here? Oh, come on. Let me hear. Who's excited to be in church tonight, huh? Heck yes. Who's at the Word and Spirit Conference this weekend? Oh, come on. We experienced the glory of God in some powerful ways. And hey, this morning, as I was just uh, waking up and thinking about all the things that powerful, powerful things that took place this weekend, I woke up and I was like, man, the crazy thing about God is that there's always more. That even when we have these big moments where we encounter him and we experience him and we experience the love and intimacy and presence of Jesus, it's an invitation to encounter more of him. All the days of our lives, we will get to experience him more and more and more as we get to know him and pursue him with all we have. Amen. And so I'm just so excited to worship with you all tonight. And uh, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes and we just say Jesus we thank you that you take us from glory to glory we thank you for all the healings and miracles and presence transformations that took place this weekend at Word and Spirit. And Jesus, we just say we're hungry for more of you. We want to know you more. We want to encounter you more. We want to see your face. We want to be a people so yielded to your presence. We want to respond to you in spirit and in truth tonight. And so just even out loud, let's just begin to just say, Jesus, come. Just start crying out to him. Jesus, Jesus, fill this room. Holy Spirit, come rest on us as a church tonight. We yield our hearts to you. We open our hearts to you. We want to come under your governance tonight. We are your possession. We are your possession. We are your possession. Just out loud, just say, I am your possession. Wow. We love you and worship you and all God's people said, amen.
revelation to us tonight. Holy Spirit, that we would hear and we would sing the same words of Jesus and what you've done and that it would be new to us tonight. That our hearts would be willing to respond in new ways to you tonight. That our hearts would choose to be unoffended, which can only be possible by your grace, Holy Spirit. We ask that you would come and fill us, fill us tonight. As we sing of your glory, Jesus, as we lift you high, that your spirit would start to break out in new ways. That your spirit would bring new ways of worship in this room tonight. That those with hard hearts would become soft before you because as we sing of what you've done, Jesus, that's all we can do is just be softened as we think about what you did.
gaze upon your face, God. The one who saved us, who delivered us, who brought us out of death into life, the resurrection and the life. It's you, Jesus. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And we just come before you saying, all I am is yours. All I have is yours. It's all for your glory, Jesus. There's no other name in heaven or on earth to, to worship. It's only you, Jesus. You're the only one worthy of our praise, of our adoration. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're Hosanna in the highest. You're the author of life, the Prince of Peace, the wonderful God, mighty counselor. You're mighty to save God. We adore you. We adore you, Jesus. Yes, God, we look upon your face with great joy and great delight.
we love you, we praise you and worship you and all God's people said, amen, amen. Come on, why don't you just give the Lord a shout of praise? Come on. Why don't you turn to somebody next to you as we get ready for a powerful, powerful service. Oh, kids, you are dismissed. How do I forget? Go have the most amazing time with Miss Brenda. Who's hungry to get more of God tonight? Come on. Well, hey, let's hunker down for a second, get through some announcements, and then let's get ready to experience the presence of Jesus even more and more. Amen? Awesome. Well, hey, if it's your first time, welcome. Welcome to Riverhouse. We love to connect with you. So at the end of service, go find the Connect booth. We'd love to get to know you and have you a part of this community. If you have any questions, we want to answer them for you. So the Connect booth out front is the place to go. We also want to welcome all of you on live stream. We miss you. We wish you were here and just hope that I just believe the same spirit that is here tonight is going to meet you in your home in a powerful, powerful way. Come on. I got one announcement, and I'm really excited for it. So October 22nd through the 24th, we have the Young Adults Retreat at Faith Heights in Donnelly. And I'll just tell you, uh, I was over this ministry for two years, and at this retreat every single year is the highlight of my year because it is a place where the young adults come hungry. And I can tell you some of the most powerful experience I've ever had with God, and I've watched the presence of God descend in a powerful, powerful way in this space. And so if you are 18 to 25 years old, you need to be there. You need to be there. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be amazing. I promise you there is nothing better that weekend than you can do but get away with a bunch of young people to pursue Jesus with everything that you have and encounter him. It's powerful. I have watched so many kids' life radically, radically changed by going to this weekend. And it's not because we're seeking these mountain high experiences, these mountaintop experiences. It, what happens on retreats happens because we're setting everything else aside and saying, today, this weekend, I'm setting myself apart. I'm consecrating myself to be with you within community. And so I just encourage you, sign up. It's a hundred bucks. If you need help paying for it, let us know. We'll figure out a way because we want you there. I want to be there so bad that I'm just going to come. I'm going to show up because it's going to be awesome. Yeah. You know, it's a good thing when people who aren't 18 to 25 still want to be there. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be awesome. Oh, and I want to add, for a long time, this ministry was mostly just a college ministry. Uh, we feel like the Lord has led us in a place to ex expand the tent pegs. And it's not just for college kids anymore. It is a ministry for anybody between the ages 18 to 25. And so come. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. Lastly, um, Kay. So obviously, this is we don't do two services. And we're doing two services today. And uh, we've just been experiencing the presence of God so much this week through the Word and Spirit Conference. I believe that we're going to encounter him in new and powerful ways tonight as well. And so uh, we have, but we do have people who are with all the kids who are serving kids this week. And uh, oftentimes when we have guest speakers, parents will just stay in there and then our wonderful kids volunteers are stuck there until 10 o'clock at night. And so really just to honor them, uh, I encourage you at about 550, we're going to put something on the screen. And if you'd go and get your kids and bring them back in, we're not going to, we're going to have a soft close the service today where we're going to just allow ministry to keep taking place up here, even as we transition to the 6 PM service. But when we put that on the screen, go get your kids, come back and just come hungry. And cause I believe kids are going to get wrecked tonight. Also, it's going to be so good. 
And then also, um, we're going to, when God comes, oh, I just want to say this for if you're new in this family. Sometimes when God comes, um, weird things can happen. How many of you have seen weird things happen before, right? I'm a weirdo. The weird things happen to me all the time. And, uh, and oftentimes in spaces like this, we can become, if it, this is really new, we can become spectators. I remember when I went to my first gathering like this and, and I came and I didn't know to, what to do and I kind of just became a spectator and I heard this voice and it was the voice of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it at the moment. And he said, choose to press in. You know, choose to press in. Open your heart. And I, you know, because I felt offense and weird things start coming up in me. And in that moment, I learned whenever I start to feel offended or whenever I start to feel like a spectator, I respond with the opposite spirit to engage. And I've seen God teach me more things in those moments than ever before. So tonight, as we have two powerful, powerful services, if you feel something coming up in you, just respond with the opposite spirit. Come. If you're feeling offense, start honoring. If you're feeling weird, just say, I'm going to press in, God. I want more of you. Amen? Okay. All right. Let's stand up, and we're going to do the offering reading for tonight. I got somebody calling me like crazy. Oh, I think it's DoorDash for the worship team. I'll be right there. (laughs) I ordered seven bowls for the worship team, and they only delivered four. I'm like, what in the world? Okay. Don't give somebody with ADD the mic. All right, God, we turn to you. You are our helper, rich in mercy and abounding in steadfast love. In every season, we call upon you, for you are faithful to answer. We trust you today with our finances and with our entire lives, knowing that you alone are God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. What a weekend we had in here. I am telling you, we experienced the presence of God. There was holy laughter and joy. There was deliverance, healings, miracles. Over and over, we were just encountering God. And it was in a beautiful and blessed weekend. And I have good news. It's going to continue tonight. Right? And it is because we have been so blessed and honored to have this amazing couple here with us. William and Chantil Woods travel with Dr. Randy um, Clark all over the world with Global Awakenings Ministry. In fact, they are getting ready to go to Brazil where they'll be speaking to like five or 6,000 people. Keep them in your prayers. I think they go to Virginia after that. So this is a powerful couple. I mean, William's testimony is like nothing you have ever heard before. I mean, seriously, I don't know if you're going to get it again tonight, but, but I hope you do. But literally, this man was strung out on drugs, hit by a car, in the hospital, literally should have been dying. And Jesus Christ came and encountered him. And he had a radical transformation. He didn't even know who Jesus Christ was But now he is a man that is carrying so much power, so much passion. The passion that he carries for God oozes out of him. So I am am hopeful for tonight. Listen, everybody comes tonight with a, a different need. You come from a different place. But wherever that is, I want you to picture what you need from God tonight. Picture what you need from him because he is here. And he, listen, he is a God who hears. And so whatever it is that you need from him, they have fought for so much. And they are going to carry it up here and release it to all of you. So I believe that whatever you're thinking you need from God, he's going to do even greater than you can think or imagine. So I want you to stand and give the warmest welcome to this amazing man of God, William Wood. Come on up. Wow. Amen. Let's give Jesus some praise. Don't sit. Let's give Jesus some praise. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Wow. Wow. Amen. Now you can take a seat. (laughs) 
Well, good evening, family. How many of you uh, participated in the conference this weekend? Wow, wow, wow. It was such an amazing time. How many of you encountered the presence of the Lord in a way that you never had before? Let's see a show of hands. Wow, everyone, look around at this. That's beautiful. That's amazing. One of the things I love about the nature of God and just His love and His presence and His power is that you never have to leave the place of first love passion. Like He's new to you every day. Like you will never reach the depths of His love. That's how vast God is. It's just every day I wake up, I'm like, yeah, thank you, Jesus, you know. Just like a brand new day. I never leave the place of first love passion, and that's just beautiful. This weekend, we began to talk about a lot of different things, and I was just blown away by Dan, blown away by Jordan, all the other ministers that was ministering this weekend. I was just blown away by the revelation, the truth that was being released into the atmosphere. And how many of us believe that something was deposited into the region this weekend? Yeah. Amen. I believe that things in the city are going to begin to shift. And so I want you to put your spiritual eyes on, which is your imagination. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. That doesn't mean faith is blind. That just means it has another set of lens in which it sees. I would like to suggest to you that it's your imagination. One of the things that the world has tried to strip from the church is this ability to dream. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now to him that can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think, that's the reach of your imagination, according to the power that works within. The reason I'm saying it because I believe a deposit has been released into the city of this region, this church, and I want you to use the eyes of your faith, your imagination to dream to dream with God and begin to see what you can't see with your natural eyes. Amen? Amen? Over the course of this weekend, we've really talked about so many different things, but I made a couple of comments that I kind of want to focus on uh, with you the, in this session here, where I talked about Genesis chapter 3, and I talked about how the enemy comes against us. And how many of us would like to know how the enemy comes against us? Okay, four or five people. All right. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Now, for you that do not know me, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I'm not a devil guy. I'm a Jesus guy. However, we do not need to be ignorant of the schemes of the enemy, right? But we do need to see him through the proper lens. and We need to see him through the lens of Christ. Because when you look at Satan through the lens of Jesus, you see him as a victim to your victory. You realize he is a defeated foe and you are victorious because of the Christ that lives within. That Satan is completely disarmed and defeated unless you re-empower him with your life. And so when I began to study the scriptures and I just began to study the word of God as it relates to how the enemy comes against us, I really discovered that there's only two categories that the enemy uses, or two weapons. Let me use it that, in that language. There's only two weapons that Satan uses to come against you. The first one is this. I want you to write it down. Deception. Some of us know Satan is the father of all lies. So by, by his nature, he's going to try to deceive you, right? Do you, want to, do you know what the lifeline of deception is? Ignorance. The greatest enemy to your life, the greatest enemy to your destiny is not the devil. It's your own ignorance of the Christ that lives within. As a matter of fact, I like to say it this way. Deception dwells where ignorance lives. Ignorance is what gives place to the voice of Satan to come into your life. Why do you think Scripture says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge, for a lack of understanding. That's exactly what that means. To co connect that over to John chapter 8, verse 32, it says, We shall know the truth, and the truth shall. So by that context, the truth I don't know is what's keeping me bound. If the truth I know sets me free, then it's the truth I don't know that actually keeps me bound. So all bondage is a byproduct of ignorance. All bondage is a byproduct of a lie believed. And the lifeline of a lie is ignorance in my heart for that lie to be planted. 
One of the, so when you live in ignorance, you actually give Satan a weapon against your own life. Why do you think there's been such an attack against the Word of God in, in over the past several, several hundred years and it's increasing even more and more and more where the authority of Scripture is being undermined? Because Satan wants the church ignorant. Satan wants believers ignorant because an ignorant Christian is a defeated Christian. William, it can't be that simple. It can be that simple. Matter of fact, it is that simple because I've been applying these words, these truths to my life for 16 years now, and I'm here to tell you that a lot of my sin problems that I had that I couldn't get over, truth just caused it to believe. When I filled my mind with the Word of God and meditated on the Word of God, you, you'll notice you do not act out in sin which you don't first meditate on in your imagination. Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, As a man thinks in himself, so he is. And so deception is a weapon that Satan uses against us, and ignorance is a lifeline to that weapon. The second category or the second weapon that Satan uses is temptation. Now, that's pretty obvious, correct? But the way Satan tempts you is important for us to understand. When a spirit comes against you or when Satan comes against you to tempt you, what he does is he literally projects his own desires upon you, hoping that you mistake that desire as yours. In other words, when a spirit of fear comes against you, the reason you experience fear is because the spirit itself is afraid. It's literally afraid and it's projecting its own desires, projecting its own nature upon you, hoping that you come into agreement with that nature. The Bible also talks about us having desires of our own for going into sin. But what I'm going to highlight this afternoon is how the enemy comes against you. And how you can tell the difference between a spirit tempting you and just a, a temptation of your flesh is that you will feel compelled to do it. You will, it would will almost feel irresistible to you. When you feel compelled to sin or it's irresistible sin, uh, sensation to you, you know you're dealing with a spirit and not just a desire of your flesh. Some of you are looking freaked out right now. Remember... You look at Satan through the lens of Jesus, and so Satan is not a person you need to be afraid of. The Bible says he, ro he, he goes around like a lion. doesn't say he is one. He's a master at creating illusions for you to buy into that illusion, right? And so this is how he tempts you. He projects his own nature upon you in hoping that, he, he, that you come into agreement with that nature. And now that human agreement is what empowers his nature to become your nature, is what empowers that desire to become your desire. In other words, it has no power to produce any fruit or any result in your life until human agreement takes place. So these are the two weapons that Satan uses. Now, I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. For you that were here last night, listen, I know I preached last night. I'm going to kind of teach today. Is that okay? I want to give you some things. Because I feel it's necessary for us in this day and time and the season that we're in as a church but we need to understand the tactics of the enemy, but always keep it in context of Christ. In Genesis chapter 3, you have Adam and Eve that are created in the image of God. They're absolutely perfect in every aspect of their being. How many of us know God did not create them with a sinful nature? They were not prone to sin. So I would like to suggest to you that the only way they can fall into sin is through the two weapons that I just told you about that Satan uses in Genesis chapter 3. You see it right here. Well, you and I are a new creation. You no longer have a sin nature. You now have a nature of God living on the inside of you. You're born again spirit, right? And so you're, at, you're not bipolar. You don't have an old nature and a new nature fighting together. No, what you have is, is, is a new nature and you're warring against an unrenewed mind. Because what that old nature left behind was patterns of thought, memories, scars in your emotions. And so that's why the Bible says you have to renew your mind. So what you're battling against is an unrenewed mind, not an old nature. I wish I could really spend about six weeks explaining that a little bit more. Some of you are just going to have to take my word for it. 
Because you're like, man, I sin with the best of them. Are you sure? Anyway. And so when you get to Genesis chapter 3 right here, I want you to pay attention to, to, to these two weapons. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, let's look at it. It says, now the serpent was more crafty. That word crafty means cunning. Than any, any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now let me create context right here. In Genesis 1 and 2, you see God creates a man, he creates Adam and Eve, and he gives them dominion, he gives them authority, he gives them responsibility, and one of their responsibilities is to rule, right? Have dominion over every living creature in the land. Is the serpent a creature? Absolutely. But he is crafty. So what is the very first thing right here that is exposed in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 is that Eve is ignorant of the craftiness of the serpent. It is her responsibility as a delegated authority of God to have an understanding of every creature she is to rule over. And so now the enemy comes, the serpent comes, and he is crafty. I always like to, to explain Satan's nature like this. He's, he's like an illusionist. When I was a kid, I loved uh, illusionist TV shows. I would watch it and just be blown away by the illusions, right? Until they started coming out with these new shows explaining how they did the illusions. And I'm like, watching, I'm like, well, anybody through practice and time can actually do this, right? It wasn't as impressive anymore. I would like to suggest to you that that's Satan. He's a master at creating illusions that have no reality to it until you agree with them. He's a master at creating false narratives. Boy, do we see a lot of false narratives in society today, right? I believe the prophetic mantle that he is using in society today to project or to prophesy his false narratives is the media. Not one amen on that. All right. I'm not trying to tell you that your TV is the Antichrist, but your TV is the Antichrist. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. I have to watch Alabama football on it. Come on. <laughs> Roll Tide, my young lady over here wearing an Alabama shirt. Come on, Jesus. Anyway, before I get too carnal here. But this is how he does it. The enemy is a master illusionist. He's a master at creating false narratives that absolutely have no power to it, no reality to it until you agree with it, and then your faith brings substance to the illusion. Why do you think Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The King James Version says, well, I like to call it the King, King Jesus version. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith brings substance to what it grabs a hold of. And so when you come into agreement with an illusion, you bring substance to that illusion. In other words, your faith actualizes it. Why do you think Satan loves to talk to you? Why do you think the greatest battlefield of your life is in your mind? Because if he can project a thought in your mind and get your voice to prophesy that thought, all of a sudden you just, you just gave fruit to a thought. Why do you think Proverbs chapter 18 says, Life and death is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it eat the fruit thereof. You see, Satan attacks your mind because he's seeking the authority of your voice. I do not allow the enemy to come to my mind with his false narratives, false illusions. He does this in subtle ways. How many times have you ever had someone call you on the phone and say, hey, I need to talk to you for a minute? Well, all of a sudden, your imagination didn't go to the negative. You're, you immediately start thinking, worst case scenario, right? Especially if your pastor, oh, let me talk to you for a minute, William. I used to get those phone calls all the time. And I would just sit in my house and torment my mind, not realizing that some of that torment was just the enemy trying to poison my mind against my leader.
some of, our, some of us have allowed our minds to be poisoned by illusions, improper meditation of our mind, false narratives that come, and we work ourselves up in emotional traumatizing experience without even knowing if it's real or not. Man, when I was a kid, man, I, loved, I used to love to take my Super Nintendo. This is back when they had Super Nintendo. And I would sit, I would go out into my yard, and I would sit out in my yard, and I would play my Super Nintendo. And now my mom, she was, she's a hermit. I mean, she would never leave the house. She wouldn't even peek out the window blind. I mean, she would just sit in her room. And, 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 and I would sit out there for hours playing my video game, and I cannot tell you how many times I walked into the house. I wasn't out there doing anything. I'm just playing my video game, right? I walk into the house, my mom's like, boy, I know you've been out there smoking dope. Some of you moms know what I'm talking about. You sit at home and dream worst case scenarios that your kids are doing. And then you work yourselves up into this traumatizing emotional experience over something that it may or may not be true. I believe a lot of PTSD that's going on in our life today is, is through improper meditation of the mind. So the enemy is crafty. He's going to come against you. He's going to come with these false narratives, these false illusions. He's going to try to pollute, poison your imagination because that's the lens of your faith, and he wants to stifle that out. Man, I, I'm preaching something right here. Man, we, this is like a half a verse. We haven't even got through verse 1 yet. He goes on to say this, and he said to the woman, so the serpent comes, he's crafty, and he speaks to the woman, and he says this, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? What is Satan doing? He's asking a question that undermines the command of God. Every, the purpose of Satan's voice is to displace God's voice in your heart and in your mind with his. So everything that he does is aimed at displacing a voice, putting his voice inside of you because he wants his voice to be the one governing your life because he wants your voice to be the prophet of his. All right. And so he comes and he says, did God really say? Well, how does he do this in our life today? He gets you to look to the facts of your life instead of the truth of the gospel. You may be asking, well, William, I thought truth and facts are the same thing. Every truth is a fact, but not every fact is a truth. It may be true that you're sick, but truth says by his wounds you are healed. So what are you going to do? Are you going to be factual or truthful? It may be true that you're in financial difficulty, but his word says in Philippians 4.19, he'll supply to you according to his riches and glory. So what are you going to be, factual or truthful? You see, Satan, he does this in your life today. He undermines the word of God. He undermines the command of God by constantly getting you to look to the facts of your life. Why? Because facts tell you what reality is. Truth actually carries its own reality. You see, the facts of your life will tell you the level of destiny you can have. And most of the times it's contingent upon the history that you had. Oh, Lord. If I listen to the facts of my life coming out of atheism, coming out of, coming out of crack addiction, meth addiction, man, I was just some crackhead from the backwoods of Alabama somewhere living in a mobile home trailer. If I listen to the facts of my life, you think I'd be traveling the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Man, if I listen to, listen, I've had so many Christians coming to me and say, wait, well, you shouldn't be able to be anointed like you are. You don't have this education or you came from this place, you know, you're bald. <laughs> What's that got to do with anything, you know? And I mean, if I listened to most Christians, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. To be honest with you, I've had to cast more Christians off of me than demons. You know what I'm saying? I, you, I better leave that alone. But this is how the enemy does this. He gets you so focused on the natural realm, so focused on the facts of your life that now you're blinded to the truth of the gospel. Now you don't even see the truth. He, 
He will introduce facts into your life in a moment where it appears he's telling you the truth and God is the one lying. He waits until there's moments to attack that. Let me share a story to illustrate this. In Luke chapter 1, we have a story of a man named Zacharias and a woman named Elizabeth, which is the mother and father of John the Baptist. Now, let me tell you, let me ask you this question. If you went home tonight and you were in your bedroom and you're just praying, you're just worshiping God, and all of a sudden an angel appears to you and this angel begins to prophesy to you your destiny, how would you respond to this angel? Would you believe it? I always have someone that comes up to me, well, wait me, you first got to test the spirit and know it's from God. Come on, just go with the story. <laughs> of course, you got to know it's from God. And let me ask you, would you believe it? If you knew the, the angel was from God and the message was from God, would you believe it? Yeah. Well, let's see how Zacharias handles his angelic visitation. This is a priest. He's a man of God. He's like me, you know, good looking and preaching. Anyway, <laughs> in Luke chapter 1, Verse 11, it says this, An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. In other words, he's come in response to his prayer. Now listen to this. He begins to prophesy about John the Baptist to Zacharias. Listen to the language the angel uses. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Doesn't say she might says will your wife elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name john you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the lord and he will drink no no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the holy spirit while yet in his mother's womb he will turn many of the sons of israel back to the lord their god it is he who goes a forerunner before him and the spirit and power of elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make a people prepared for the Lord wow isn't this a strong prophetic word like this would blow my mind if an angel came came up to me and prophesied that my wife and I are going to have a kid that's well, going to be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in her womb come on let's look what Zechariah says Zechariah said to the angel how will I know this is for certain I'm thinking well, you have an angel standing in front of you for one thing, <laughs> from God. Well, I need, I need four dogs and two birds to fly by three times and chirp twice so I know God spoke to me. <laughs> you know you do this stuff. <laughs> God will speak a word to you. It's evident and it's obvious to everybody in your life. God spoke to you, but yet you, get, you, get, you need one more confirmation. Well, I, I just got to know God spoke to me. Well, at some point, your confirmation seeking is really you seeking a license to be disobedient to the word. You just want to pretend that you want to be obedient. So what you do, you delay, you delay the word long enough. You feel comfortable being disobedient to it. You put enough confirmations out there where now you feel like you're off the hook. And when God speaks to you, then he goes silent. You better have quick obedience. The reason he's silent because he's already spoken and there's no need for him to say anything else. I've spoken to you. You understand it's my word. It's my, it's my decree in your life. Now it's your responsibility to act. You see, the silence of God is not a sign of his negligence. It's a sign of yours. Yeah. All right. He goes on to say this. He says, how, I'm, how do I know this is for certain? And now he quotes the facts of his life to the angel. He says this, for I am an old dude, and my wife is advanced in years. What is he doing? He's taking the facts of his life, and he's prophesying it to the truth of his promise. Now he's actually telling the angel why the word that's from God cannot happen because the facts of his life tells him it can't be possible. And so he's literally allowing the facts of his life to determine the level of his destiny. 
And so instead of taking the word of promise and prophesying to the facts of his life, he's taking the facts of his life and prophesying to the word of his promise. Many of us do this in our life today. God has a, spoken a word over us. We have destiny, but then we look at all the facts because somehow we think we need to gather in all the facts so that we can make a wise decision. But when it comes to the word of God, and the word of God has decreed something over your life, and it's authoritative, then I don't need to consider all the facts of my life that undermine that word. Because that word has more powerful than the thousand lies of the devil he can ever speak in your life. And so he tells the angel, he says, well, I'm, I'm an old man, but my wife is advancing years. What do you mean we're going to have a kid? What, what do you mean this is going to be John the Baptist? What do you mean he's going to be filled with the, with the Holy Spirit while he's in his mother's womb? Man, I need some wine. You know, John the Baptist, never mind. You'll get, you'll get that later. And he says this to the angel, and so the angel kind of gets frustrated with him. This is how I think this happens. And the angel has to justify his own existence to Zacharias, and he says this. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and bring this good news, dummy. That's kind of how I picture it. Gabriel saying this to Zacharias. He justifies his own existence. He said, I, I'm from God. I come directly from his presence. Have you read the Bible? No. Now pay attention to what Gabriel has to do in order for the truth of his promise to actually be birthed in his life. He goes on to say this. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day which these things take place. Wow. Because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time. I don't know if you have considered this passage of Scripture. Gabriel literally closes the mouth of Zacharias for the duration of the time so that this promise can actually come about in his life. So in this situation, his silence carried more authority than his voice. When God speaks something in my heart and I feel like I cannot say anything in faith, I am silent. I don't say anything at all because I know the word that God speaks carries within itself its own ability to demonstrate, its own ability to perform, its own ability to bring that fruit. All I have to do is agree with it. But yet, Zacharias goes mute for not, at least nine months. Some of you need to go on a silent fast for at least 45 years. I'm telling you, if you just shut up for a couple of months, you'll, you'll realize a lot of the promises you've been begging God for just come out. Just, anyway. I almost demonstrated that. Is this making sense? These are just subtle things that, that, call, that hinders us from walking in the reality that God wants us to walk into. And here we have a story that, that illustrates the power of agreeing to the, of the effects of your life and you speaking them out. They can literally abort your promise. If Zacharias could have talked for the duration of this time, his words would have aborted his son. This is the forerunner to Jesus Christ. Do you think he's a fairly, fairly significant person in church history? Yeah, I think so. He's a forerunner to Jesus. And so uh, Gabriel's like, well, I can't let this dude talk. Because if I let this dude talk, man, he's not even going to prepare the way for Jesus. So I'm just going to have to shut him up. <laughs> Listen, some of us need to shut up. I hope I'm not saying too brash. Uh, but I'm telling you, some of us need to be quiet. And we'll see more promises be birthed and come through our life, through our silence, than through our voice. If we cannot align our voice to truth. And I'm saying something right here. Now let's back, go back to Genesis 3, 2. 
That's just one verse there. And then, then, the, then the serpent says that to, to, to Eve, and then she responds like this. The woman said to the serpent, let me just stop right there. This is the first mistake. She starts talking to a deceiver. You don't need to have a conversation with the devil in your home. You don't need to talk with Satan. You need to talk to Satan. You need to tell him to get his butt out your house. Because nothing that he has to say is redemptive. Everything he has to say is deception. Everything he has to say is a lie. And it's just to, and it's just to twist the word of God. It is to displace God's voice in your life with his. And so if we sit around and we just listen to the voice of the devil all the time. No wonder we're beat up and depressed and fearful and anxious. Well, how do I know the devil is speaking to me? Any, any thought that you have that produces hopelessness is of the devil. Let me say it a different way. Any thought that you have in your head that contradicts the fruit of the Spirit is from the devil. Man, my emotional state of being is the emotional state of being of the Spirit of God that abides on the inside of me. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and faithfulness. All these things, they're my state of being. And so if I have a thought that produces a different emotion than that, then I command that thought to leave my mind. I take it captive. I do not tolerate it because I know that thought is the voice of the deceiver and I'm not having a conversation with it by meditating on it. You can ask my wife. I still, I, I told you last night that I preached to myself in the mirror for one year. That's how I learned how to preach. I still do that to this day. If I get up in the morning and I don't feel right, what I do is I'll walk myself into the mirror and I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, well, you need to get yourself right. And I preach the word of God to myself. And I, and I, and I will preach the word to me until I see me being that reflection again of that truth. And then I, and then I go on about my day. See, I'm not going to have a conversation with the devil. I'm not going to have a conversation with Satan. And how he does it in your life today is through thoughts. Lofty things raised up against the knowledge of God. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, You are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Think about it this way. You sow a seed, what would he do? You reap a harvest, right? Well, you sow a thought in your mind, you will reap an action. You sow an action, you will reap a habit. You sow a habit, you will reap a, a, a lifestyle. When you sow a lifestyle, you reap a destiny. See, there's a divine connection between what you're thinking today and what you're fulfilling tomorrow. Today's thoughts is literally the prophetic voice of tomorrow's destiny. The predominant thought you have in your head right now is the prophet of your life. How do you know you're talking with the devil? How do you know you're having a conversation with him? You have thoughts that contradict the word of God, the nature of Christ, your destiny, your purpose, your value that produces emotions in you that is contrary to the fruit of the Spirit. This is how you know you're talking with the devil all the time. <laughs> he goes on to say this. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you should not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Humble us, no, that's not what the Bible says. It's, it's probably 99% of what God said. She added to God's command by saying, and not touch it. See, when you add to God's word, you also, you now create another landing strip for the voice of the deceiver to come into your heart. So in her response to the deceiver, in her response to Satan, now she, 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 she begins to add to God's word. And when she begins to add to God's word, it begins to undermine the authority of that word. Are you guys okay? You're staring at me. I wish I had six months here. I can get through Genesis 3. <laughs> this is good stuff here. He says, you should not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Let's move down. 
to verse 4. I'm trying to hurry up here. I only have seven minutes left. The serpent responded back. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Now here's the temptation. Here's how he projects onto Eve. This is where I wanted to get to. You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, who did Satan want to be? He wanted to be God. So whose desire is this actually? He's saying this right here. I want to be God. I want the world to worship me. So therefore, if I can't be God, you're the one that's made in his image. I'm going to convince you you're not like him either. So I'm going to project my desire to be God on you. And I'm going to convince you that you're not like him. I'm going to convince you that you're not created in his image. I'm going to convince you that there's something he's withholding from you. I'm going to convince you that there's something you need to do to become like who you already are. You're already like Jesus. You're not becoming more like Jesus. When you renew your mind, you're becoming more aware you're already like Christ. And so if you're still trying to perform to become who you already are, you'll never become who you already are because you convince yourself you're not that person. <laughs> you surely will not die for God knows that the day you eat from me, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What is, uh, what is Satan also trying to get her, get, get her to do? He's trying to get Eve to partake of another source of understanding. You see, I believe right here, this is just, just my opinion. I believe right here that, that there was an unconscious in, in Adam and Eve. I believe the conscious was produced when they partook of another tree, the tree of knowledge. Because if you look at how your conscience functions, it, it, it is the makeup of the tree of knowledge. Everything that they understood about God came directly from his voice. All understanding. And so what Satan wants her to do, what the serpent wants her to do, is to partake of another source of knowledge so that now he can interpret God to her. Man, we're living in a day and time now where the church's understanding of God is coming from the wrong tree in the garden and we're allowing Satan to interpret God to us. And we wonder why we have a perverted sense of who the Father is. Is this helping? Yeah. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, have you ever thought about this? She never once saw this tree good for food until this moment. This is how you know the de deception has already crept in. Satan's desire has already crept in. Now he's already reinterpreting her world of you. In other words, he's giving her another set of lens to interpret life through. Now she's seeing things that she didn't see before. Now she's desiring things she didn't desire before. You see, deception will cause you to desire what was once undesirable. Boy, it's mighty quiet in this charismatic church. <laughs> Family, I'm sharing with you truths that have absolutely set me free changed my life. When the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she's already seeing through a new set of lens. Do you realize you do not see the world the way it is? You see the world the way it is through your worldview. And so now she's actually seeing a tree that she was never de she never desired that tree before. You know, and another thing that's ironic, let's say there was 20,000 trees in this garden. Satan, the serpent didn't come up to Eve and say, man, isn't it great that God let you partake of 19,999 trees in this garden? No, what did he do? He, he highlighted the one thing that God said don't do. And he twisted it around to make it, a, make it a, to insinuate, to make it seem as if God is withholding something from you. 
Now, God may be protecting you from something, but he does not withhold who he is from you. He does not withhold his kingdom from you. Matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So if you think God is withholding from you, you're deceived. If you think God is withholding healing from you, you're deceived. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Verse 7, then the eyes of both were opened, and they, listen to this, and the eyes of both were opened. What I want you to realize right here is Eve's sin is a byproduct of deception and temptation. Adam's sin is worse. You want to know why it's worse? He was not the one talking to the serpent. His sin was an act of his own will. He was not deceived. So his sin was more severe because he willfully rejected the command of God. He willfully said, I'm going to go with her. The reason Satan was doing this is because at this particular time, Adam and Eve were joint heirs with each other. The covenant that we live in now, we're joint heirs with Christ. I would like for you to consider it this way. It's like a joint banking uh, banking account. If you're gonna, if you're gonna uh, 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 cancel out this account and transfer the funds to somebody else, because you have a joint banking account, that means both people on the account have equal access to it and ownership. That means you have to have two signatures in order to transfer the funds. Because Adam and Eve were joint heirs with each other, Satan needed Adam's signature for the for the authority and the dominion that they carried to be transferred to him. The beauty of the new covenant that we live in is that we're joint heirs with Christ and Jesus is not going to sign his signature to something that causes your kingdom to be transferred to Satan. That should be some good news. Because some of you have been deceived into thinking that Satan has stripped you of all your gifts and your callings and your anointing. No. Nope. Jesus didn't sign his name to that nonsense. He's not going to allow his kingdom to be transferred back over to the devil. And so this is why Adam's sin is actually more severe. But we want to pick on Eve. I want to pick on Adam. He should have understood. I know I'm the one in authority. I'm the one that's been sent here to rule and to reign. We are to co-reign with each other. We're joint heirs. And so I should, I should liberate my spouse instead of become a partaker of her sin. But, but because he doesn't want to disagree with her, because he doesn't want to somehow hurt her feelings, he partakes of the same sin not realizing he's signing his will over to be controlled now by the serpent. So what the serpent was doing is he was, since he couldn't become king of heaven, he was working to become king of the earth. That's why Satan is referred to as the ruler of this age. Jesus came to strip him of that authority. And now he has given that authority back to the church to now constantly exercise the judgment he has already decreed over Satan and his works by destroying Satan's works through the church. It says when they both partook of this, oh man, I'm out of time. When they both partook of this, both of their eyes are open. Well, what are their eyes open to? A world they were previously protected from. An understanding they were previously protected from. Pay attention in this verse what they do with the first thing that they do. Their eyes are open and the first thing that deception will cause you to do is this right here. And they knew that they were naked. In other words, deception will always cause you to look at yourself and pervert your own purity. 
They looked at themselves and saw that they were not clothed. How many of us know? They never noticed they weren't clothed before. Why? Because now they have a perverted sense of lens. Now, in other words, perversion means wrong version. Now they're looking at themselves through the lens of perversion, and now they see themselves as shameful instead of holy. Now they see themselves as sinful instead of righteous. Now they look at themselves and shame right here comes into the man comes into the garden what did you think what do you think jesus came to liberate you from shame judgment condemnation romans chapter 8 verse 1 says therefore if anyone's in christ there is no condemnation for those that are in him first john chapter 3 verse 21 says if your conscience does not condemn you you have confidence before god god is not the one judging and condemning you it's coming from two sources either your guilty conscience or satan romans chapter 5 verse 1 says therefore i have been justified by faith and i have peace with god Man, if I'm already at peace with God, no, why in the world do I live in shame and defeat and condemnation and judgment? There's nothing that you can ever do to change God's mind about you. God is not relating to you based on your performance. He is relating to you based on your faith and what he has done on your behalf. And the first thing that this new set of lens does, this first thing that their eyes are open to is that, th is that they're now ashamed at their own being. They're ashamed at who they are. If you look in the mirror and you're ashamed of who you are, you are deceived. You believe lies about yourself and you need to be liberated from those lies. I'm preaching better than you're listening. He goes on to say this. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. What does this deception try to do? Try to get them to cover themselves by the work of their own hands. This is where performance mentality is birthed. This is when law mentality kind of come, come, comes in. It's right here. Works mentality now i got to do by the work of my hands that can only be accomplished by the work of his. And now I'm trying to perfect what is already perfected, so therefore I actually pervert it. When God created you, he rested, not because he couldn't make any more trees, but because he was finished in his work. It is like a, it's like a master painter when he paints a masterpiece and he rests from that masterpiece because one more stroke would actually ruin the picture. They were perfect in every aspect. And then when they tried to add to by the work of their hands, they perverted the picture. Whew. Jesus came to liberate you from these things. These are the two weapons that Satan uses to come against your life. Deception and temptation. The purpose is is to get you to go down this line of destruction, to, to go down this downward spiral, shame, condemnation, judgment, redefining who you are, perverting your purity, trying to add to what's already perfected. And you get all the way to the end of it, and you realize that Adam begins to blame Eve, and the last stage of the deception is a victim mentality. You see, a victim will always blame everybody else for their issues. And when you become a victim, now you are a product of your environment instead of your created purpose and destiny. You see, what Satan was trying to do is he was usurping the victory, the victory of Adam and Eve and replacing it with the victim of who he was. All right. I didn't want this session to be too heavy, but Amen. But this is how I want to end because we need to 
We need to get ready for the 6 o'clock service, and I want to make sure Dan has plenty of space and time. And In Hebrews chapter 9 and Hebrews chapter 10, it says, The blood of Christ will cleanse your conscience. It's something I do every single day. I almost get broken up every time I talk about it it's because it's important. I've noticed in my own life, and you probably notice in your life too, that Satan always waits for an opportune time to attack you. Most of your opportune times is when you're trying to go to sleep at night. Why? You've been awake all day. You've been at work. You've been at whatever it is, whatever you're going through throughout your life, throughout your day. You're kind of emotionally drained. You're getting ready to go to rest. So what the enemy does is he tries to attack your mind in the night season so that you go to sleep, but you don't go to rest. And so this is what I do. I've noticed that the enemy comes against me in my night season, and I notice that he's trying to get me to not rest because if I don't rest, I'm not emotionally strengthened to resist his, 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 his tactics when he comes against me. And this is why some of us are just, we can't resist the devil anymore because we're so emotionally drained because we don't rest. I'm going to give you a warfare, spiritual warfare tactic that you need to add to your arsenal. Sleep. Sleep. And so this is what I do. I get, I'm in my bed. I lay hands on myself. I don't always lay hands on myself. I lay hands on my mind or whatever. And this is what I pray. Lord, I ask that your blood will cleanse my conscience. Lord, I ask that your blood will purify my thoughts and my memories. Lord, I ask that your blood will sanctify my emotions right now according to your truth. What am I doing? I'm exercising the victory of the blood over my conscience, over my emotions, over my carnality. The victory has already been purchased for me. I'm just exercising that over my emotions every single day. I don't, I don't take a day off. I direct all my attention to God. And then, you know what? I close my eyes. I go to sleep. Instead of having nightmares, I have visitations. I wake up preaching to myself. I mean, really. I mean, some of the messages I preach, I received in a dream. God will speak to me in a dream. I don't even know what a nightmare is anymore. I don't even comprehend it no more. I don't even know what depression is anymore. I don't comprehend it. It's not part of my life. I haven't been depressed in over 13 years. I don't believe in depression. I believe in peace. I used to have ministers tell me all the time, William, you need to connect where people are. I said, no, I need to connect where people need to be. If only connect to where people are, they only ever be where they are. And I just teach them how to manage their sin. I'm not, here, I'm not interested in teaching you how to manage your defeat. I'm interested in teaching you how to step in your victory. And I'm just bold enough to actually say the things that most ministers aren't willing to say because they need your tires to keep the church rolling. Anyhow, it's probably why I'm an itinerant minister and don't have a church. My old pastor told me, he says, William, the things that you say, if you were still pastor, your church wouldn't be very big. <laughs> That's right, I'll break that lie right here. Yeah. This is what I do, family, every day. You know what I'm taking? The gospel pill. That's my antidepressant. <laughs> That's my vaccine. Gospel pill. Just take it. This is how I want to end today. I want you to stand to your feet. And I want us to pray this prayer together. Babe, can you hand me a bottle of water, please? I'm going to ask. I feel like the Lord wants me to partner with the prayer ministry team. And so I'm going to ask that the prayer ministry team or leaders here of this church, if you will begin to make your way up here to receive people for prayer, I would like to ask you to do that now. And what I want us, the rest of us, to do is this. Is I'm going to pray this prayer over your mind. And I'm going to break off lies 
that the enemy has tried to plant in your mind. And as a sign that these lives have been broken off, some of you are going to sleep tonight. But not just sleep, you're going to rest. Some of you have been emotionally drained, and now you just cannot withstand the onslaughts of the, of the devil against your life. And you need to sleep. You need to rest. So let's pray this prayer together. Let's put our hands over our mind. Say this with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, ask blood, I ask that your blood will cleanse my conscience. Cleanse my conscience. Purify, my mind, Purify my mind. Purify my thoughts. Purify my thoughts according, to your word. according to your word. In Jesus' name. I just want you to stay right there for a moment. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to clap my hand. And when I clap my hand, it's going to be like a line of demarcation in the spirit realm. And it's going to break off some things off of your mind. Hey! You can put your hands down now. I believe some of you, just as I said that, as we prayed that prayer, some of you felt peace come over your body, come over your mind. Unless you just wave your hand up. You just, if you felt peace come over you, see? all across the room that peace right there is your state of being you do not have to live in turmoil you do not have to live in anxiety you can actually live in peace I live in peace I do not partner with fear I do not partner with anything that contradicts the character and nature of Christ and his word what I want to do now is want to officially dismiss this service but I want to give you an opportunity because some of you may need some further prayer in this area and this is why I wanted to partner with the ministry team here because I know these guys love uh, inner healing and, and, and going into that realm and really helping the whole person get put back together again and so I want to give you an opportunity to come to receive some prayer from one of these prayer ministers and so if you would like to come up to here to receive some prayer just begin to make your way up here now if, you have, if you're a parent, you have children, you can go ahead and begin to make your way out there to get them. And listen, you don't have to come up here specifically for this one thing. If you have other things that you need prayer for, these prayer ministers are here for that. I just want to give you an opportunity to come up here. So, Father, I just ask that this weekend will be a Kairos moment for many of our lives that these deposits that's been released into this church, into this region, Lord, that these seeds will germinate, will begin to grow in the soil, in the hearts and minds of the people. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and you would water those seeds right now, that you would give them the grace to protect that seed, to protect that word that's been planted in their heart. I speak to every lying demon spirit coming against your heart, coming against your mind. You've been exposed as a liar. You have no right to torment or afflict their mind any longer. And I command you to leave from their thoughts, to leave from their ears, to leave from their physical body. Some of you have been dealing with afflicting spirits. You think it's a, it's a natural sickness, but it's a, a spiritual thing. It's an afflicting spirit. And I command that right now to lift up of some of you in Jesus' name. Matter of fact, if you have ailments, you just go ahead and test your body out. Some of you see that you're healed right now. Matter of fact, there's this young lady right up here. Yeah, you're shaking. The Spirit of the Lord is all over you, young lady. I just bless what the Holy Spirit is doing right now. That divine love encounter that you're having with the Holy Spirit right now. Let's go deep inside of her, Father. There it is. There it is. There it is. Power of God, come. Increase. Increase. This young lady right here with the black on, the Spirit of the Lord is all over you too. And I just see a similar type of love encounter that God is pouring into your heart. And he wants you to know that you are significant, that he sees you, that you are his daughter, and he's well pleased with you. I just want you to hold your hands like this. I bless what you're doing with this young lady, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you would come with another wave of your power over her right now. On the count of three, I feel the Lord is going to touch you. One, two, three. There it is. Fill her up. Fill her up. Power of God, come over her right now. There it is. There it is. It's okay. It's okay. He's just trying to go deeper and deeper and deeper in your heart. He's not here to hurt you. He's not here to afflict you. He's here to, to heal and to mend. 
I see him almost like rearranging some things in the heart, like putting together a puzzle. And it's not, and it's not that you are broken. It's just that some of the things are just kind of out of place, and he's putting them in proper alignment right now. I just see thoughts and patterns of thought just being broken right now. I just bless your mind. I'm not addressing the church. I'm just praying in the spirit. Holy Spirit, I just feel your presence in this room, God. I feel that the Prince of Peace is settling in many of our hearts and our minds right now. Again, as we begin to close this service out, I encourage you, if you need to receive some prayer ministry, we have this prayer ministry team up here. I'm going to ask Jackie or whoever is going to close to make your way up here. I want to leave you with this, family. I've enjoyed being with you this weekend. I know we've talked about a lot of hard truths, but it is truth. And I want you to know that I love you. I care about you. That's why I'm willing to speak the truth. If I didn't tell you the truth, I would be rejecting it for you. And I'm not willing to reject the truth for people. They need to have their own, they need to have the right to be able to make that decision for themselves. So again, I love you guys. Bless you. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, if you're still receiving, we're going to turn the lights down and keep this as a place to just continue to let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Come up for prayer and you're welcome to stay for the 6 p.m. service. Um, We're just going to kind of flow right into it. So bless you.